Welcome back friends. In today's video, we'll start a new topic, which is organic chemistry. So for today's session, I'll be using GAISA series of organic chemistry. And we'll start a part of introduction to organic chemistry. And for the today's session, we'll discuss about the introduction to organic chemistry. Then we'll study about the unique properties of carbon. Then we'll study about the difference between organic and inorganic compounds. Then later we'll go to discuss about the uh, classification of organic compounds. Then we'll finish with the uh, different categories or types of carbon in organic compounds. So that will mark the end of our session for today. And for another time, we'll start discussing about the type C of organic reactants. Now, let's go on. I am using guys a series of organic chemistry and if you don't have it, uh, I beg you to have a copy of it so as I can't write everything here on my board. So I will be just writing a few important concepts and illustrations for better understanding. But for the sake of notes, you can buy in Gaiza. I don't think if it's much costful, if the videos you get them free, so buying Gaiza is not so much costful for you. Now, we start our, our discussion by discussing the, the meaning of organic chemistry. Organic chemistry, as a rule, is the study of organic compounds, or is the branch of science which deals with the study of organic compounds. So, different books which you read, they will have a, a short history of organic chemistry. They will have uh, different details explaining about the organic chemistry. And different others, they can light in different ways. But don't worry about that because it doesn't matter. Any way that you explained about the history or any way that you explained about the introduction to organic chemistry, an important thing for you to understand is just the definition. Other things, they are not so much important for you to understand. What is important for you to understand is just the meaning of organic chemistry. Now, according to how Ngaisa explained a short uh, explanation of organic chemistry he said at one time chemists believed that organic compounds were fundamentally different from those that were inorganic because organic compounds contained a vital force that was only found in living system so why they called them organic because they were found only in the living system or they contained forces and such kind of forces only present in the living organisms. So the origin of the name organic is because these compounds, they were found in the dead organic matters, such as plants and animals. That's why they were called organic. So the term organic, it is because they are present in the dead bodies of organisms. That means not only in the dead bodies, also in the living bodies of the organisms they were also pleasant. So what we are saying is that they found these compounds in dead organic matters, but being in dead organic matters does not mean that they would not there when the, the organisms, they were dead, but they were still in the living organisms' bodies even when they were still living. So that's why they are called the organic compounds. They are called the organic because they are present in living organisms. So that's the greatest fact. However, nowadays, we can synthesize organic compounds industrially, but still they are called organic because their origin is in the living systems. That's why their name is still called as organic. So thus, according to this concept, organic compounds can only be created by living organisms. Only living organisms are able to create organic compounds. These chemists divided the materials into two categories. Those isolated from plants and animals. From plants and animals. Don't ask me about fungi and the protozoa or bacteria. Because uh, the former classification of living organisms by Aristotle, living organisms, they were classified into plants and animals. So, protozoa, um, bacteria, fungi, all of them, they were grouped into two 
groups. So we, we, we didn't have uh, five kingdoms, we had only two kingdoms, plantae and animalia. So when we are saying of plants and animals, we are talking of all living organisms. According to the time of classification of living organisms as how the history of chemistry and the biology was. So what we are saying that those materials isolated from plants and animals, that means the materials isolated from living organisms were classified as organic and they were derived from the word organism because these are called living organisms. Plants and animals, they are called living organisms. So the materials isolated from plants and animals, they were called as organic. And while those trace back to minerals, they were inorganic. Those which do not originate in the body of living organisms, they are called as inorganic. So with this point of view, organic chemistry can simply be defined as the study of compounds of carbon derived from living things. Study of compounds of carbon derived from living things. So, in other words, what we can say about organic chemistry is not only the study of compounds of carbon derived from living things, but in other words, organic compounds we can define it as. However, nowadays we can synthesize organic compounds industrially. As I told you, that in the industry nowadays, uh, they assemble different materials and they put catalysts to them. The similar uh, biological catalyst which is present in the animal body or in the plant body, normally called as enzymes, the similar biological catalyst can be uh, similar, it's not the same, similar. The chemical which perform the same thing to increase the rate of chemical reaction can be present or can be put in the industrial environment and then we synthesize the organic compounds in the industry. However, the origin is organic body. The origin is organic body. Now, in, in easier words, see, when we are talking of organic compounds, organic, organic compounds, when we are talking of organic compounds, because as I said, organic chemistry is the study of organic compounds. So, an easier term to define organic compounds, they are compounds of carbon, they are compounds of carbon derived from living organisms. Compounds of carbon derived from living organisms. And when we are talking of organic compounds, it's the broad group of compounds. We can't start mentioning the organic compounds here. And if we are starting mentioning the organic compounds here, we can't finish them. So, it's the broad group of compounds. It's the large number of compounds. Now, how can we know if this um, carbon compound is either derived from living body or it's not derived from living body. We have just only a few exceptions of organic of carbon compounds which are inorganic. Many of the carbon compounds they are organic. But we have few exceptions of carbon compounds which are inorganic. Now, let's go and then later we shall see what are those Organic, uh, what are those carbon compounds but are not uh, organic compounds. Now what we are saying is that uh, however nowadays it is possible to synthesize organic compounds uh, like you layer from in organic compounds which previously was observed only in the living tissue. So nowadays you can use uh, the inorganic compound to synthesize uh, organic compound. For example we have the inorganic compound uh, ammonium Cyanate, ammonium cyanate, uh, it is written as NHO then OCN. So, in the presence of the enzyme, this compound called as ammonium, ammonium, ammonium cyanate, 
this compound ammonium cyanide in the presence of enzyme that means in the industrial system we call it as a catalyst not an enzyme again so in the presence of catalyst in the presence of catalyst this compound can be converted into urea can be converted into urea so urea it is co then it is n h2 then it is so this compound it is nh not nh2 it is nh then 2 or sometimes you can write this uh, urea in a different way uh, you can write it right in a different way uh, by writing it is C by writing it is structural formula the structure of your layer so it is C uh, now going to O then it is NH it is NH so this is your layer this is your layer so formally your layer were found only in the living body Formerly, urea were found, were found only in the living body. And as we know that urea is the end product of metabolism of excess amino acids. Excess amino acids, when they are deaminated, you get ammonia. And after deamination of ammonia, then that ammonia can combine with carbon dioxide, also in the presence of all. enzymes in the all-in-time cycle in the liver, we are forming urea. The process of deamination takes place in the liver, also the process of urea formation takes place in the liver also. So now, this process was uh, possible only in the living body, formally, but now it can be formed even in industrial. That's why it is possible to synthesize uh, uh, industrial fertilizers, industrial fertilizers uh, such as urea, urea is one among the categories of industrial fertilizers. And it contains the large proportion of um, nitrogen because of um, this compound. So it is synthesizing industrially. Now, organic chemistry has undergone a larger change such that there are over a million synthetic organic compounds like plastics. When we are talking of plastics like uh, this, my marker pen, uh, polyvinyl chloride, all of the tanks you know, all of them they are organic compounds. As I will study later at the end of this topic, in the organic tool, uh, the start of polymerization, how the polymers they are formed. We shall see later PVC, the examples of, of polymers. So, the important thing to note about organic compound is that they all contain carbon atoms, although there are few exceptional of components of carbon which do not behave like organic and therefore they are termed as inorganic. They are termed as inorganic. So as I told you formally, that not all compounds of carbon, they are organic. We classify some of the compounds of carbon as inorganic because of their property. How they behave, it is the reason we are classifying them as the inorganic compounds. So we are classifying them as inorganic because of how they behave. So, we have a few exceptions. Let's see uh, the definition of organic compounds. Organic chemistry, by definition, organic chemistry is the branch of chemistry that deals with the study of carbon compounds, excluding simple compounds, see, such as oxides of carbon. These are compounds of carbon which are inorganic. Compounds, compounds, of carbon which are inorganic. Very important concept for you to remember because when we are defining that organic compounds they are compounds of carbon, it doesn't mean that all compounds of carbon they are organic. Some of them they are inorganic. So uh, we have uh, in the first book we have oxides oxides of oxides of carbon so here we have carbon monoxide and the carbon dioxide oxides of carbon oxides of carbon they are in organic compounds also we have carbonates and hydrogen carbonates carbonates 
components and bicarbonates bicarbonates so carbonates they can be written as CO3 and the bicarbonates they can be written as HCO3 these are two negative this as one negative so carbonates and bicarbonates they are also inorganic compounds also we have carbon disulfide carbon disulfide carbon disulfide carbon disulfide c s2 carbon disulfide also we have carbide carbides carbides when you are talking of carbides the compounds are which contain a certain element and then are the carbon carbides carbides for example when i am saying calcium then the c so because this has a balance four so it will be calcium two then c this is called calcium calcium carbide so this is the calcium carbide it's also among the, the examples of the compounds containing carbon but they are inorganic in the last group we have cyanides 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 they are also inorganic the form of the cyanides it is C double N this is the, the, the form of the cyanide cyanide is just the it's just the radical it's not the compound so, for example, uh, you can have uh, you can have different uh, different. Uh, let's say it's potassium. This is potassium. Then C N. So we call it as potassium. Potassium cyan. So cyan is not the it's not the compound as itself but the functional group. So any compound which is either oxide of carbon, carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide, carbonates and bicarbonates, and carbonates and bicarbonates they are also radicals. So we can have potassium, I mean we can have sodium carbonate, potassium carbonate, calcium carbonate, and bicarbonate also as well. Also carbon disulfide, this is the Compound, carbon disulfide, it is in your gut. Also, we have carbides. For example, you can have calcium carbide. This is just the, the example, uh, example of carbide. Example of carbide. So we can have calcium carbide. Also, we have cyanide. For example, you can have potassium cyanide, sodium cyanide, and, and different compounds. So these are compounds containing carbon, but they are in your gut. It is very important for you to know uh, because sometimes. Uh, I know for your level it's not so easy for you to, to be asked if they are organic or inorganic, but it's important for you to, to understand. So, this uh, marks the, the, the end of our discussion about the uh, definition of organic chemistry, that is the start of organic compounds. And as you say, organic compounds, they are compounds of carbon with a few exceptions which are listed here. Compounds of carbon with a few exceptions. Now we are going to start with the sources of organic compounds. Sources, or sometimes you can say it's origin, but you know the origin of organic compounds is the living body. So what we are studying here it is the sources, different sources, how we can, uh, or where we can found organic compounds. Now we are moving to sources of organic compounds. Sources of organic sources of organic compounds. Compounds. So we have the light of sources of organic compounds and 
some of these sources they are often and some of them they are layer but you need to know these sources uh, they are not normally asked in the exam but you need to be competent you need to know everything so don't just say uh, I, it's not important for me to know this no it is very important for you to know everything so main sources of organic compound are living organisms many sources they are living organisms that are plants and animals I told you before that don't ask me about fungi and bacteria and protozoans all of them they are classified into these two categories plants and animals so the various organic compounds have been artificially prepared in the laboratory in the laboratory so let's see some of the important sources of organic compounds our first source is the plants and animals plants and animals plants and animals so as we said earlier as we said earlier about organic organic compounds that their origin were the dead organic matters the remains of planting and the animals it is where the organic compounds they were uh, originally present so formerly we didn't add uh, synthetic organic compounds we had only the organic compounds which were found in the remains of plants and animals and the investigation revealed that the, the, the compounds were present even in the living plants and animal bodies so what we are saying is that many organic compounds are obtained directly from plants and animal sources these include carbohydrates carbohydrates as we are studying in, in biology in biochemistry carbohydrates such as cellulose carbohydrates carbohydrates such as cellulose cellulose sugar sugar such as glucose and the other compounds here in this group starch starches these are just carbohydrates then we have other compounds such as proteins we have proteins we have proteins and then we have fats fats and oils fats and the oils we have enzymes enzymes however enzymes they are also protein in nature um, from enzymes we have uh, nucleotides nucleotides all of these they are organic compounds and most of these for example when you are talking of carbohydrates carbohydrates they are polymers polymers of sugar or polymers of mono mono saccharides mono saccharides so we have a simple sugar let's say it's glucose c6 h12 c6 h12 o6 this is it, glucose we have glucose and then glucose tend to polymerize let's say this one molecule of glucose so we join by joining two molecules of glucose we get what we call two molecules of glucose we get what we call maltose and the maltose is one among the example of what we call as in disaccharide disaccharide so we are joining two monosaccharides saccharide means sugar monosaccharide single sugar to get it Dye saccharide to sugar. Then we can join uh, about three to nine. Three to nine. So let's say there is this number. And if there is this number, all of this molecule it is then this oligo oligo saccharide. Oligo saccharide. So oligo means uh few number of sugar molecules few number of sugar molecules less than 10 they are called as oligosaccharides but if we join this 
into a very long, a very long chain. If we join this into a very long chain, then this, all this molecule, it is called as a poly, then saccharide. So the word poly means many. Poly saccharide means many sugar units. As I told you that saccharide means sugars. So polysaccharide mean, means many sugar units, many sugars. So examples of polysaccharide, see, here now we are coming to starch, we are coming to cellulose, we are coming to glycogen, and things like that. So all of these starch, cellulose, glycogen, their origin, we are tracing them back, we come to found glucose. And glucose is an organic compound because it contains carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. As I will see later, many of organic compounds in their property, they contain carbon and hydrogen, also oxygen, many of organic compounds. Many of organic compounds. But one thing you need to understand here that the origin of these compounds, which are together called as carbohydrates, see? Carbohydrates. All these carbohydrates, see? which we are consuming as ugali, as rice, as wheat, as mandazi, as anything, all of these carbohydrates, their origin is glucose. And glucose is an organic compound. So these are called as polymers. They are polymers of glucose. As I shall study in the end of organic 2, the concept of polymerization, we shall see how these molecules they are formed from poly are from monomers. So glucose it is termed as a monomer. When it joins, it combines many units and it forms a poly. So this is just an example of one of the source of organic compounds which are plants and animals. All of these proteins, fats, enzymes, I, could, I can explain all of these and they are originating from the monomers. For example, when we are talking of proteins, proteins they are originating from amino acids. Proteins, they are originating from amino acids. So the polymerization of a large number of amino acids tend to form a protein. And uh, such kind of protein is the polymer of amino acids. So tracing the structure of amino acids, you found that uh, it, is the, it is the organic compound because it contains carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and sometimes nitrogen and salt. So let's go to the second source of organic compound. Second source of organic Compound. Our second source is natural gas and the petroleum. Natural gas and the petroleum. Natural, natural gas and petroleum. Petroleum. Natural gas and the petroleum. So, most of you, you can ask yourself that what, what is the origin of natural gas? You are, you are hearing some of the information that he, uh, we are taking gas maybe from Tuala, from somewhere. What is the, the origin? Where is the natural gas originated? Uh, the, the, the court answered that he, natural gas, they are the remains of plants and animals. Or they are the remains of living body. And they have stayed for millions of years. Millions of years. So after staying down in the rocks for millions of years, they have been converted into natural gas and petroleum. Petroleum is uh, it's just like oil. They call it as oil, mafuta. So natural gas and the petroleum, their origin is dead organic matter. So what you are saying is that natural gas and the petroleum are among the major source of organic compounds. They are used as fuel and also they are used 
as fuel. However, sometimes they are, they are synthesized, they can be synthesized industrially. So, and also obtained through synthetic organic reaction. For the production of hundreds of useful organic substances such as solvent, synthetic labor, explosive and plastics. So, from the nature of this and the petroleum, first themselves you can use as fuel. This is the first basic mechanism or basic use of natural gas. You can use them as fuel. But also from natural gas, from natural gas, you can perform a number, number of chemical reactions. Chemical reactions. And these chemical reactions will result into formation, formation of different products which can be used in industrial industrial and domestic so from the from the reactions which can be performed from natural gas and petroleum, we are getting different materials or different products which can be used industrially or domestically. And sometimes these they are used, these products from me, they are used to synthesize synthesis of different materials of different materials such as plastics. Plastics is just uh, like one among the example, but there are many as they have been mentioned here. Um, though synthetic organic reaction for the production of hundreds of food, used for organic substances such as solvents, synthetic labor, explosive and plastics. Explosive synthetic labor solvents and things like that. So this is the second source of organic compound. It is the natural gas and the petroleum. Natural gas and petroleum, the second source of organic compounds. Now let's move to the to the third source. To the third source of organic compound. Let's move to the third source of organic compound. Our third source it is coal. It is coal. Coal. So coal it can be used uh, itself as fuel. As you know that formerly there were trains and different industries which were they were driven by using coal because uh, coal it is full of energy. Now because it is full of energy, burning, burning of coal releases what energy, and normally this energy it is in the form of heat. So this energy in the form of heat, sometimes this heat, it is used directly, directly to dry. Or operate, operate machines, or in other words, engines. Or sometimes this heat can be used to heat water, and if water is heated, we get water vapor. Water vapor. Water vapor. So this water vapor, this hot water vapor can be used as source of energy 
to drive machines. So this is the first first use of coal. However, it has um, a lot of uses, but this is the first use. Burn of coal itself. Burn of coal itself, we can get energy. Either direct as heat energy or we can use coal to heat water. And then by heating water, we get water vapor, which contain energy to drive our engines or machines. That's the, 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 the first use of coal. But also coal, uh, coal is another major source of organic compound. It yields coke and coal tar on pyrolysis. You have the reaction which is called pyro, pyrolysis. Pyrolysis. So, in the process of pyrolysis, coal tends to produce two products coal and the coal. Coal tar. So coal and coal tar. Coal tar also can be done, or it can be, in, it can be given different reaction, and due to those reaction, it can deliver different compounds. So what you are saying is that pyrolysis, first by definition, pyrolysis, we are saying is the thermochemical decomposition. Thermal chemical decomposition. If the thermal chemical decomposition of organic material at very high temperature, or organic organic material at very high temperature of organic material at very high temperature then in the absence of oxygen or any hydrogen in the in the absence of oxygen or any hydrogen now, why we are heating or we are decomposing in the absence of oxygen or any halogen? This is because at this very high temperature, in the presence of oxygen, this organic material, they could undergo burning or they could undergo complete body into carbon dioxide and water. So we could not do decomposition. There is difference between decomposition and burning. In the decomposition, what we are talking here is just the breakdown of a large large Compound into small compound in the absence of oxygen or halogen. So in the presence of, of oxygen, it could burn into carbon dioxide and water. Also in, the, also in the presence of halogen, it could react with halogen to form the halogen carbon. To form halo, to form halo carbon. As how we shall study later, how alkanes. So this is the fact why we are burning in the absence of halogen and oxygen. So in the reaction of pyrolysis, we are getting coke and coal tar. All of these products they are they are used. So what we are saying. Sometimes uh, we, we are not doing pyrolysis, we are doing what you call as the destructive distillation. Destructive distillation. So, destructive distillation is the process by which organic substances such as wood, coal, and oils 
and oil shell are decomposed by heat in the absence of air and distilled to produce useful products such as coke, charcoal, oils and gases. So by decomposing coal tar either by pyrolysis or by destructive distillation, we are getting different useful products. We are getting different useful products and they are used in our daily life, in our daily life. Now from there, uh, let's move to the fourth source of organic compounds. Fourth source of organic compounds. Our fourth source of organic compounds is the synthesis. C synthesis. As we say that uh, many organic compounds nowadays they are produced in the industry. So when we are talking of this uh, fourth source, we are talking of the organic, comp uh, organic compounds which are produced in the industry. Industrially, they have studied different catalysts of the reactions, and then they are using uh, those catalysts to produce different compounds. So simple organic compounds derived from petroleum or coal has been converted into thousands of useful material by synthetic method. This includes so in the in the organic compounds we have uh, synthetic we have dyes, dye, we have rubber, we have dye, we have rubber, and then from there we have fibers, then from there we have plastics, plastics, and then we have drugs, drugs, we have vitamins. As I told you before, that organic compounds such as enzymes, organic compounds such as enzymes, enzymes, they are what? Proteins. Enzymes, they are proteins. And as you know, proteins, they are what? Polymers of amino acids. So now, by the study of the structure of amino acids, you can synthesize protein, and this protein it can be an enzyme. So different drugs and most of the drugs which we are using, they are enzymes, substrates, or in the medicinal language, we are calling that they are enzymes. Either agonists or antagonists. So, what do we mean when we are talking of the enzymes, agonists, and antagonists? I want you to understand me the concept of uh, drugs, they are synthesizing organic compounds. Drugs or vitamins. Uh, left in dyes and, uh, and, and things like that that you have mentioned, I want you just to understand why we are saying that drugs they are synthesized organic compounds. For example, we want a drug which targets certain enzymes. And let's say this enzyme is the enzyme which uh, performs the metabolism. Let's say it's the, the, the enzyme. Or let's say we want a drug which could inhibit the function of insulin. So, assuming this is our insulin, assume this is our insulin, and if this insulin, it has different receptors, different receptors, but let's say here now is our cell, here is our cell, and in the cell membrane here, we have the active site of this insulin. So the structure of the active site, the structure of the active site is usually similar to the structure of the of the hormone or the enzyme. And this is what we call local and key hypothesis for those who are studying biology. Local and key hypothesis for the case of enzyme. But insulin is an hormone. Even if it is an hormone how hormones they are acting in the body is the same as how 
the enzymes they are acting because all of them they are proteins. Now, let's say, let's say now, this insulin want to bind here. Insulin want to bind here. Here is our insulin receptor on the cell membrane. Let's see here, here we have the nucleus of the cell. Nucleus of the cell. Now, if we want a drug which will inhibit the action of insulin, a drug which will inhibit the action of insulin, that means the drug must either act on a certain site at the receptor site of, of insulin or should we go to inhibit the production of insulin in the pancreas. So we have different drug targets. But for the case of the drug which will come to inhibit a drug, drug, a drug which inhibits action of insulin on the cell surface membrane. What is the important feature of this drug? The important feature of this drug is that it must have the similar similar shape as that of insulin. And if it has the similar shape as that of insulin, for those who are studying biology, we call it as the competitive competitive inhibitor of insulin. Even if you don't study biology, don't worry, you understand this. So it is called, it is called competitive inhibitor. Why it is called competitive? Now, let's see. What does the term competitive mean? It is called competitive competitive inhibitor because it competes with insulin for the active site active site on the cell Memory. Thus, if we will increase the concentration of the drug, that means drug will bind here. If drug will bind here, when the insulin comes, it will not be able to bind here. So the shape of our drug, our drug uh, can have a different composition, but you must make sure that the shape of our drug, the shape of our, of our drug, it is the same as the shape of insulin. So when it comes and it stays here, when insulin comes, when insulin comes, it found that the active site, active site is occupied by a drug. By such way that means this drug has already inhibited the action of insulin and by that way we can sometimes call it as the agonist I mean antagonist it's not agonist it is antagonist or inhibitor But the best way oh, to call this drug is the inhibitor because the antagonist could do the different 
reaction or could do the different response. For example, if the binding of insulin could increase the uptake of glucose into the cell, antagonist could decrease or could increase the removal of glucose from the cell. So I hope you have understood how drugs, they are synthetic organic compounds because they are synthesized and they must be similar to organic compounds in order to function in the living body. Out of this mechanism, all drugs could not, could not do their function. So we have different types of drug receptors, don't just claim uh, the, the enzymes, they are, uh, they are only drug targets. We have drug targets uh, as receptors, some of them they, they, they target on the, on the enzymes, uh, some of them on the, on the receptors and different drug targets. So, we have already finished about the sources of organic compounds. And let us end up here. In the next session, we will start our discussion with the uniqueness of carbon as the part of introduction. So, this is the part one of introduction. Then we have part two of introduction. Thank you. Let me wish you nice studies. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and to share the link of this video to your fellow students. Thank you.